Pastor Conlon is my pastor. And uh, I, I was reading Philippians today, and I read something that said, there it is. I was thinking about Pastor Carter, and Paul said to the Philippian church, he said, I'm sending you Timothy, because I have no one else like-minded who will naturally care for you out of his nature. When I first heard this man, in fact, the way he came to New York City, pastor a small church up in Canada, a uh, former police officer in the Lord, got a hold of his life, and uh, at Times Square Church, I was in probably the hardest time of my ministry, overwhelmed, and uh, <clears throat> I, I was driving my car, I said, God, you have to do something, and the great prophet Leonard Ravenhill had given me two of his tapes a long time before, and I had thrown in my car with a bunch of other tapes, but on that day when I was crying out, the Lord said, uh, get those tapes. And by the way, I, I forgot, a day or so before, I had thrown all the tapes away, but those two from Pastor Carter. Some uh, Pastor or Leonard Ravenhill had given to me said, <clears throat> you need to hear this young man. And I, the Lord said, get it and put it on. I heard one tape and then I put on another. Halfway through, the Lord said, call him. I pulled off the car, off the road. There was a, a number on the tape and I called. Just Teresa answered and I said, would you, um, this is Brother Dave, so would you please ask your husband if he'd come and preach for me? He did. And when he got up to preach, I said, that's a God-touched man. That's a man of God. And our hearts were one and... Now he pastors a church, I think about 8,000 or so, and uh, four godly men raised up, or, or he has wife and one, four godly preaching pastors, and uh, he's my pastor, and I help him as much as I can. But in the last uh, five years, I've been traveling in ministers' conferences. I'm not going to preach tonight. I I'm one of the... Fathers, the Lord said, you don't have many fathers. And when I was a young preacher, I go to conferences, and I said, I wish, there were older men ago, I said, I wish they would tell me if they have any battles like I have. And I, I got to thinking, those men that have been used by God don't have problems. And I said, if I ever get a chance to pre preach to ministers, I'll, I'll bear my soul. That's what Paul did. He, he kept telling his story over and over again. If, Timothy must have gotten weary. I mean, it's shame how God touched his life and what he went through, uh, the temptations he went through, uh, shipwreck, and all. He, he just told the story over and over again, even in prison and the pathos and all, all they went through. And I have good reason to open and bear my heart because of what I read Paul the Apostle. I had four or five different messages. Uh, I thought I might preach. They were new messages, but they just didn't fit. And when I came, I've been in all the services and sitting in the back. And the first night, uh, the Lord said, just uh, don't even think about a sermon. These are great preachers. Uh, bear your heart. Heavenly Father, you have to help me so that no self is glorified, but you would speak to hearts. Lord, if these are the days that we preach, they are. If we believe these are the days that we see the fulfillment of the coming of the Lord and the judgment upon all that is unlike Christ, then, Father, we have to get serious. My God, will you speak? I, I ask for the touch of God, and I ask, Lord, that you speak. Don't let anyone leave without being moved. Lord, I believe there are many that came and say, I... I, I'm discouraged, and I'm going to go hoping God will speak to me, hoping I will have a word. And you've done that, Lord, but again tonight, oh, Jesus, speak to me, sanctify me. Lord, I'm unworthy, but I thank you that you make us worthy to proclaim your word. Surely this treasure in earth and vessels. Now speak clearly, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to talk to you about the cost of a fresh anointing, the cost. I have no theological 
definition of the anointing. I, I really don't see any need to go in the Old Testament and tell you the roots of it and uh, what the anointing meant in the Old Testament because I believe it's something different in the New Testament. Jesus said the Father anointed him to preach the gospel. I, I don't know how to describe it, but I know when I hear it. There's an old song about the anointing. It says, when you hear it, you'll know it. There's a weightiness to it. The, the, the man, the woman who is truly anointed of God never jokes when he handles the word. There's, there's a weightiness. I'm amazed and shocked. I don't know who started. I don't know where it's come from. But now it, it's even in the Assemblies of God and you know, the evangelicals to start every sermon with a joke. That's not the anointing. I'm not going to talk about what it means other than when I hear it, I know that it's a man or woman that's touched God. I know that I'm hearing something more than a man's heart. I know that somebody who's been through difficulties and temptations and trials has gotten to the throne. And when I hear it, I'm convicted. When I hear it, I'm moved. When I hear it, I know I'm driven to my knees. And there's such a weightiness about it that I can't ignore it. I have to deal with it. I was called to preach when I was eight years old at a camp meeting. Now, some of you young men don't know what that is. We didn't have motels, hotels. We didn't have fast food restaurants. Christians got together and cleared some land and put up some tents and a tabernacle. And preachers would come in and preach. And it would be preaching all day and praying all day and half the night. And at eight years old, I went down to a camp meeting. <clears throat> My father was a preacher and grandfather. And I knelt and the Lord called me for three, two, three hours. I was under the anointing and I received a call to preach the gospel that I've never turned away from. I was a teenage preacher, but I pastored a church when I was a young man, 21 to 28 years of age. Uh, I'm sorry, 22 or 23 till I was 28. Little town in Pennsylvania, Phillipsburg, town uh, preach to about a hundred people. And it's a, it was a Pentecostal church. And I, I was fired up and preaching Pentecost. But about two years, three years of it, I, there was something that began to bother me. Preaching that we had a full gospel and nobody was getting saved. I was preaching to the same people they were satisfied if I married and buried and had fellowship with them and nothing changed. And there was something burning in my heart because at eight years old, he put a call to win souls in my heart. I, I wanted to, to reach out to a whole world, even as a, a young preacher. And, and I said, this doesn't make sense. We claim to have the full gospel. We claim to have something the Baptists don't have and others. And we claim the full gospel. And yet they're out in the streets. And we are not, we're sitting here. And on the, about the fifth year of this, I said, I can't handle this anymore. I said, God, there has to be more. Because I would come home and just sit and watch a lot of television, like cowboy movies and watch television. But I said, oh, God, there has to be more. I can't live like this. If this is Pentecost, I don't want it. I don't want anything to do with it. And the Lord said, do you mean that? And I said, yes. He said, all right, if you just give me the time that you spend watching television, give me equal time. In fact, I had to get rid of it because I didn't know how to handle it. And I began to pray. I began to seek God. And I got my Bible, and I would go out in the woods. Our parsonage was on a hillside, and up on the hill I would park. And I told my wife, was well, anybody come, they can blow the horn, I'll come out of the woods. And I had a tree there, and I, I had my Bible, and I began to just swallow the Word. I began to absorb the Word. It began to change me. It began to break me and melt me. You see, God does not give the anointing to lazy preachers, lazy Christians. He won't do it. There's a cost to the anointing. 
describe it as you will. You'll know when you come to a place where God changes you, where you will never again be satisfied as long as you live without seeing God at work in you and walking with you, and you know that something's happening to you and every time you speak. And the Spirit of the Lord began to fall on me, began to break until there was a weeping and a brokenness. And the Lord said, start just walking the streets here in your little town. And I did, and God began to save a few souls. But I, used to, I, I remember the anointing when it came. I'd go out in the woods and prophesy to the trees. Even when we had company, I, I used to fall on my face and just weep. And cry, God use me. I want to see a true Pentecost. I, I want to see God at work. Yeah. I went to church one Sunday and I, I couldn't stand up. I rolled under the seat. I thought it was a nervous breakdown at first because I couldn't stop trembling. I knew God was touching me. That I went home. <clears throat> but that was the week. And I picked up a magazine and saw seven boys who indicted for murder in New York. And the Holy Spirit said, this is what this is all about. I've heard your cry. Now, I'm going to anoint you. He said, go. I, I went to meet those. I told about it in the cross and switchblade. And, and I, I went to try to get those boys, got thrown out of the trial. The assemblies of God... Actually, my father was assembly God, assistant superintendent of the Eastern District, and my dad said, what did you do? And then others said, you shamed the assemblies of God. I was dragged out of a courtroom. But I had seen trucks pull up, prison trucks pull up, and teenagers all chained together, coming out, going in to the prison there. I said, oh, God. Who will reach these? Folks, that was the beginning of Teen Challenge. But I remember the anointing. I, I remember I would go to places. I, I remember going to a youth camp. They asked me to speak. There was a famous evangelist, and they said, it was a young man from New York. And I got up, and all I said was, you young people, and there were hundreds of young people, said, all I said was, you're living in sin. You're playing games here. You're really not serving God. You're here. You're playing games. You're making out. And I, I just backed away, and the glory came. I mean, the power of God just swept over those kids and, and changed the whole meeting. Nobody got to preach. It, it was not, there was something of anointing. I went to a Bible school, somebody's got Bible school, during that time, and it was death, absolute death. They just sat there, and, and there was a reputation for a, such... You know, a fear of the Holy Spirit doing something, evidently. And I just got up and I said, the dead praise not the Lord, or they that go down into silence. I said, you're dead. Get up and raise your hands. And the glory came. The Spirit of the Lord fell. I knew it wasn't me. I had to back off and just watch what God was doing. And everywhere I went... There was an anointing. There was something happening. Cross and Swiss Bay was written in the midst of that, all of those blessings. And I, I had to travel all over the United States. The, the promoters got a hold of it, Christian promoters. And I, I, I traveled for, I think, two months, national television, radio television. And it went around the world, and I became what some would call famous. And I traveled in youth crusades. I traveled in conferences, youth crusades, all of massive crusades, all over the United States and around the world for five or six years. I traveled finally with two big half-million-dollar buses, band, and... 
massive meetings, but I start getting busy, very busy building organization. But you see, that took me away from prayer, it took me away from the altar, it took me away from this word. And I re you see, I know what it's like to have the anointing, and I know when it's lifted. I know when I don't have it. I know when the death moves in. I know when... I, I, you know, I, I've had young preachers tell me that have been successful, even in the Assemblies of God, some of the most famous. One of them in particular said, I know how to move a crowd. I know how to turn on the tears. I know how to move them. I know how to fall down. And folks, I got so busy... Some of you are here right now, and I'm, I'm speaking into your heart and into your spirit because you have become too busy. Or something has taken you away from the prayer closet, and now you go to the book just to get sermons, and now, God bless your heart, you meditate. That there's no hunger, there's no brokenness, there's no cry. When I go into the scriptures, I look at men that God has used, and there's always been a cry. Jeremiah said, I engaged my heart to seek the Lord. And you'll find that there was a cry. You see, Jesus said, your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. And that flesh has to be brought under control. That flesh has to be dealt with. There can be no anointing until the, ch until the flesh is dealt with. You have to do that is your part. You can't wait for the Holy Spirit to do that. The Holy Spirit waits for you. He said, your flesh... Otherwise, you're going to sleep at Judgment Day. You're going to be asleep when God has decided to move by His Spirit all over the world. And He needs you. He needs me. But He won't do it until we pay that price. All I've known since I was a child, a young preacher, all my father and grandfather preached was pray and read your Bible. There was nothing complicated about it. Get shut in with God. Seek the face of God. I've known no other way. I've gone through all the Puritan books. I have Puritans. I began to study and read books, and I got away from this book. You can get so involved in studying how to understand the Bible that you can get away from the Word of God. I remember what it was like to stand before crowds and be dead. I stood, and when, when, when you get away from that, when you get in the flesh, when you get satisfied, Everything goes out of divine order. Your home goes out of divine order. My home went out of divine order. There, my staff, disorder. Everywhere I turned was a disorder. And I knew it. I knew it in my heart. And I knew that I was drifting. But I got caught up. You say, how does that relate to me? I've never been famous. I've never, I, I, I would never face that kind of battle. But we all come to a time where we have to make a decision. You settle down. And you pay your bills. And you get a house. And you get a car. And then you wind up like the pastor that came to me in Africa two weeks ago, pastored one of the largest churches in the nation. And he came to my table while I was eating, and he stands there just broken. He said, Brother Dave, I've got 5,000 people, and I've been playing games with God for seven years now. He said, I don't know him. I've just been satisfied because people were there, and everything is well, and I drive a Mercedes, and everything's fine. But he said, I'm dead inside. Worse to that effect. There is nothing worse that I can think of for a man of God or a woman of God than to lose the anointing of God and be dead and have the knowledge that something is wrong. It was in the middle of that time. I remember the, the last days of that terrible time. The anointing had lifted and I was going through the motion still preaching to crowds. And after I preached, go back in a room and say, God, I can't go any more like this. This is not the anointing. This is not what I knew. How did I get away? And how do I get back? 
I was known around the world as a man of God. And yet growing lukewarm and cold in my heart. And then every kind of temptation out of hell. The devil saying, I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to kill your minister. I'm taking you down. I was in the middle of that, or coming to the end of that period, and I was out in Long Island in the arena, 5,000 people. And they had gathered up young people from all over Long Island. Pastors and youth pastors had brought them in, and I didn't know. You see, when you don't have this touch, this anointing, and if you are not shut in with God, and you're not serious about the things of God, and you're happy with the status quo, or, or, or you, you, you have this inner struggle, how do I get back? How do I get this anointing? How, how do I... Are you even asking these questions? Or are you even concerned? Are, are, are you sitting here tonight and asking? Are, are you examining your heart like I had to do? It's not enough to be called. I was still called. God still loved me. He bore with me. Such patience. And I got up that night and I missed God completely. I preached on marriage. My marriage at the time was being tested. I got up. It was the deadest thing I've ever done. And I went back, I knew it. I got back on my private bus, and here come the young preachers. Brother Dave, what's wrong with you? We got young people we brought in here, they're drug addicts and all these, and you preached on marriage, you miss God. I finally got so angry, I shut the door of my bus and said, I don't want to talk to anybody. It was shortly after that when I went home. I, I, I was ready to quit. Not the ministry, but my, that phase of it. And I remember so clearly saying, God, I, I, there was one meeting I couldn't cancel. I said, I'll go to this. Before we left the campus at our home base in East Texas, Brother Ravenhill came, great prophet of God. And he handed me a book this thick, 1,200 pages, Christian in Complete Armor by Puritan, written 300 years ago. He said, God told me to give this to you. Read it now. I got on my bus, went back to my private room, threw it on the couch, said, who, can, who wants to read a dead man 300 years ago, 1,200 pages? I just threw it on my... So discouraged. And uh, I wasn't 20 miles down the road. And Lord said, go back in your room and read it. I didn't go 20 pages till I was stricken. Totally stricken by the Holy Spirit. And I said, God, I don't know you. I don't know you. The word began to tug and pull at my heart. You know, sometimes I think I'm too vulnerable. I sometimes feel that I should not bear my soul like this. But you see, this is the last time. There won't be many meetings like this, and not be many times that God's able to speak so clearly to us and convict and I don't care the cost anymore. I'm 75 and I have nothing left to prove to anybody. Nothing. I want the anointing. I shut my ministry down for a year. Now you can't do that. Nobody can shut it down, but you can't shut yourself down. You can deal with your own self. And I got back to seeking the face of God. 
I got back into the Word of God and put my books aside and all, all the Puritans and all the theology books because I, I thought I didn't have a Bible school education. I need to get <clears throat> educated. That's fine. I still, there are times that <clears throat> after I've completed my study of the Word that I, I refer to these dear men of God. But the Holy Spirit came back, healed my marriage, healed my staff. healed my ministry, healed my soul, and the, the anointing came back. Now that's been over 25 years. And 20, 20 years ago, I got this desperation again. You know, when, when the Holy Spirit's about to move on you and call you to a special anointing, he'll stir your nest. Some of you have been stirred, having your nest stirred even this week. But I went back to the streets of New York and began to preach. And I was there for the summer, and we were staying in a hotel. And the Holy Spirit began to speak to me and said, this, this, I was so shocked when I got back to New York City how degenerate it had become in the time I was, I was gone. And how wicked. They, they were on 42nd Street selling heroin, a new kind of heroin, far stronger than anything. And at that time, Lynn Bias, a basketball player, had died of an overdose of heroin. And they were advertising heroin like this. Hey, I've got this stuff that killed Lynn Bias. Now, death was the ultimate high. You take this, it'll kill you. It was the ultimate high. And I broke down. And I, I remember on 42nd Street and Broadway, I began to just weep, broken before the Lord. Now, folks, the Lord had given me back my anointing. And I, I knew he was working in a very special way, but he was stirring my heart. I, I think that all true ministry comes out of intimacy. I say it again, all true ministry, knowing it comes out of intimacy with Christ. But I said, God, will you raise up a church here? I'll help finance it. I'll preach in it. I even called th that next week my friend Jim Simbla of Brooklyn Tabernacle. I said, Jim, I want to see you. We started walking the streets. I told him about what God was speaking to our heart. And, and we went to 14th Street. And I said, there's a nice theater there. Maybe that's it. And, and uh, I, I said, Jim, do you, you want to take this on and help support? And uh, he said, I've got my hands full. And I prayed, God, raise something up here, right in Times Square as a witness. The Lord said, you do it. You know the city. I went back to Texas, and I got on my knees and said, Lord, the forces of hell have never been stronger than they are in New York City right now. And you asked me to raise up a church in Times Square. I said, I'm going to need a special anointing. And I remember again saying, God, do it once again in my heart. I need a greater anointing than I had when I began when I was a young man. I need much greater anointing now. I need something I've never touched before. I need you to break me again. I need you to do something. You say, well, I, I know men that have lived all that have never had to go through what you're going through, Brother Day, but you, sometimes God takes a man and makes a laboratory out of him and, and takes him, makes him a, a, a laboratory and allows him to go through these tests where the fire is, is so strong and going through things that so many people go through to, so that we can stand and, and the things, the victories we want to share with you and do what I'm doing tonight. I would much rather just preach a sermon to you. This is a very humbling thing to do. 
I went home and I spent the next three to five months on my face. Back because the Lord said, you know the cost. You know what it's going to take. Seek in my face. Ezra set his heart to seek the face of God. Nehemiah, he hears a destruction happen in Jerusalem. And the Bible says he was overcome with grief and he set his heart to seek God. He set his heart. And you'll find it all through the Old Testament. He set his heart. The church is there. And my dear pastor here, here tonight has been called to carry on that burden. And this man is anointed and pastor Candenna is an anointed man. You're seeing and hearing the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I thank God for that. But you see, I'm 75 years old now. I still have a heart for Times Square Church, but I just came from Africa and Nairobi, and I spent time in one of the biggest slums in the world outside of Nairobi, a million, 200,000 people in a slum, no water, no electricity, and open sewage everywhere. And I was in the hovels in the little tin shacks with mothers with five children sitting on the floor water pouring on both sides and she's collecting little sugar packs that people the restaurants throw away on the dump in a nearby dump and she's breaking those down in, in dirty water serving her children sugar water five children look like little little doggies skinny and frail and then I stand out and said God, one more time, once again, I have to have an anointing. I don't want what you gave me when I was 20 to 30 years of age. I don't want what you gave me 20 years ago. Thank you for that. But I'm moving on. And I can't do it unless you give me a special compassion, unless you come and touch me once again. And the Lord spoke to my heart again. He said, you know the cost, David. You know it. Because you're going to have to make up a mind when you get in your 50s or 60s where you're just going to retire. And you're going to take it easy. See, God can't allow anybody to retire anymore from the ministry. If you've ever been touched, you've ever been anointed of God, you don't have time. You've got, you've got to say, God, use me. I don't, care. I don't care where you send me. I don't care where you want me to go, but I'm not going out with my spirit drained. I'm not going out a dry stick. I want the anointing. I want the touch of God. I'm speaking to everybody, but the pastors in particular, I speak from my heart and I'm going to tell you, if you believe these are the last days, folks, have you not seen prophecy fulfilled in the last few years? It's going lightning speed. You hear the secular world screaming that the time is up. And we preach it, we, I've prophesied it, and, and every, with prophecies are everywhere. Here is 700 Club, our dear brother, saying this next year. You, you've got um, a, a Jita dad saying that it's within two years, that the Mahdi is coming within two years, and he can't come till there's total chaos. And so he has built in Tehran a huge four-lane pavement so that the Mahdi can drive on it. And he said it's coming within two years. And he's speaking for all of the uh, leadership of, of the Muslim ayatollahs. He's speaking. They, they said they believe that there's two years left. And you have prophecies coming from all over the world now. Jesus is that our time is up. The secularists are saying the same thing. Al Gore says we've got just a few years.
If I believe that, and I'm sitting watching an R-rated movie, I believe that, and yet I carry grudges, a revengeful spirit, can't lay down the hurt. Let me tell you what the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart about tonight. And I've prayed and been fasting days for uh, that I would have at least something to bring you. I said, what's the word you want me to bring? What's, what's the one word would sum up what you want to say tonight through me? And he said, <clears throat> discouragement. Discouragement. I said, Lord, how, how do I explain that? And I just give it to you as the Holy Spirit give, had, has given to me. Discouragement about finances. There are a number of you here have that burden of finances. And you seem to be going deeper and deeper. And the Holy Spirit brought a spirit of discouragement upon you. Some are going through marriage problems. It's one thing to come to a meeting, be able to raise your hands and hide what you're going through. But God sees that burden. He sees that, that, that terror, that, that feeling that something's not right. Others are fighting a besetting sin and you're discouraged because you can't seem to get the victory. I'm not even going to go into the matter of pornography. I had a lot to say that, but the Lord said, no, don't go there. Because see, the simple fact is that if you're into that, God is very patient, loving. He's, he's probably spoken to you a thousand times already. But the time will come when God says, all right, I need you, and I love you, but I'm going to take your anointing. You're not going to have anything to say to anybody. You're going to be dry. You're going into the desert. I'll love you. I'll keep you. But you can't go with me, and I won't go with you. It comes down to that. But that's where the discouragement comes from. You're fighting that battle. And God wants you to give a victory tonight because he needs you. God can't spare one now. He can't spare one of his soldiers. He can't spare me. He can't spare you. Unfulfilled expectations. Something you prayed about, something you thought God told you and it still hasn't come to pass. Somebody you prayed for, maybe a child, someone else. But please don't tell me that you want your child saved and you don't pray. You don't agonize for it. I had a woman come to Pine Square Church backstage and said, will you please pray for my son, drug addict in prison? I said, honey, how much time have you been spent praying the last two weeks? And she said, well, I work. I'm too busy. I said, I'm sorry. I can't pray for you until you join, until you, I have nothing to agree with you for. We're not serious about it. I've heard about revival for years and years. Past, I, Brother Raven, he'll work with me for five years on my staff. And he died a broken heart. Because he wrote Live Revival Terry's and heard it for 50 years. And, and in his last hours, he was so wounded at the lightness of the pulpit. So many preachers, he called them light men. There was no heaviness, there was no weightiness. It was all lightness. It was foolishness. Now, I've waited and heard talk about revival for years, but I, I finally don't want to hear much about it anymore because we really don't want to pay the price. We really don't want to pay the price. I, I want to take you before I close to Daniel, the 10th chapter, please. I didn't start with scripture. That may have made some of you wonder, but I'm closing with scripture. Uh, the 10th chapter of Daniel. Let's begin 
Go to chapter 9 first, verse 3. Here it is again. I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God, and I made confession. And said, O Lord, the great dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. Now skip over to verse chapter 10, starting at verse 2. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three weeks. See, this man has just been in the Word, and he's read Jeremiah, and he knows that there's redemption coming, and he knows that world powers are going to be shaken. And so he sets his face. And that's what I'm speaking of the Holy Spirit in the power and the Holy Spirit. I'm saying to you, there has to come a time, and I pray it would be tonight, and it's not just being moved by something you hear. It's by a determination. It's the setting of the mind and saying, I hear you, Lord. That's what I want. And you set your mind, you set your heart now by an act of faith. By hearing the word of God and laying hold of it, God, I hear you. I know that you've been stirring my heart. I know I have some issues, and I want to deal with them. I want to walk with you, but I want an anointing. I want my people to know when I stand in the pulpit again that something has touched my life. There's a change in me, and dead churches are because of dead pastors, folks. That's, it boils down to that. And, and if, if your church is dead and God lavishes you and you get that fresh anointing of the Lord, God will either wake them up or move you to a place that's fruitful. He, he will open doors for you. But God does miracles when you begin to seek his face and get back to the simplicity of this and you devour this word of God and you stay there. You turn everything down. Because I know when I sought the anointing, was willing to pay the price, I did more in three hours of business than I used to do a half a day. God will take care of that. But here's Daniel now, and he said, I ate no present bread. And you're going to be fasting, friends. This won't happen until God sees something in you and me of determination. God, I want this. I will not let you go until you anoint me again. Some of you have known the anointing. Some of you were on fire for God. Some of you prayed and you fasted and you were close to the heart of God and you spoke the word of God with, with something of fire and anointing and everybody knew it and you knew it. And something happened. I'm speaking to sisters as well. I ate no present bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks had been fulfilled. Uh, verse 10, er, verse 9, well, verse 5, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen. You see, he began to seek God, and his eyes became open. He began to see Christ. I believe he saw Jesus himself. His body was like burl, and his face, the appearance of lightning, his eyes as lamps of fire, his arms and his feet and colored polished brass and the voice of his words like thunder, a voice of a multitude. And listen to this now. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. And the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell on them so that they fled and hid themselves. Why does God move on one man? Now Daniel would not be walking with evil men. So these had to be good men that were walking with him. And why is it that only one man hears it? Why is it that those others run and hide? Because the anointing is a very scary thing. The anointing will put to shame and send fear to those who know that's what they need, what they have missed. And it frightens and to hide. Folks, God doesn't want to pass you by in this hour. I'm not going to let him pass me by. He said, I won't pass you by. But he said, you're going to seek my face. Therefore, I was left alone. And I saw this great vision. There remained no strength in me. My comeliness was turned into corruption. And I retained no strength. Will you skip down now or go to 10, verse 10? And behold, a hand touched me. There's the touch of God. Oh, God. Which set 
me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hand. And he said unto me, Daniel, great beloved, understand the words that I speak to you now and stand upright for unto thee I am now sent. And when he had spoken the words unto me, I stood trembling. Listen to this. Then said he unto me, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day, what? You did set your heart to understand and chasten yourself before thy God. Thy words were heard. And I've come for thy words. The day you set your heart. I think what is uh, burning in my heart in closing is that of all the conferences God could visit here in the United States, I don't think you would have come to Pastor Clendenin's meetings if you didn't have a heart toward God, if you didn't have a heart for holiness. You wouldn't be here. You would be in some easy conference. And in the meetings ahead, God's going to speak so clearly to you. But you see, for a few, this is the last call. And I say it in the spirit and with love. And he's, he's saying, I have wooed you so many times. This time, I say to you in great love from the Lord and from his heart. If you pay the price, I'll open doors for you. I'll speak through you. And I'll use you again that you would have never conceived. This has not just for the ministry, but those of you that are in the congregation, you're not a pastor, you're not in the ministry, but God's speaking to you. Sister, you may be the one that God's calling to bring your husband back. Your preacher's wife, you know your husband, you know if the anointing's there. So many others I get from all over the country. And we get 25, 30,000 letters a month, and, and, and by the hundreds, will you pray for my husband? He's a pastor, and something's happening. And I don't want, it isn't, I'm scared. If you, God, speak to you also. Pastor Clendenin, I'm doing what God told me to do. <laughs> Folks, the time being pumped up is over. God says, I'm tired of your solemn assemblies. I'm tired of your sacrifices. They're not from the heart. Don't miss what God's about to do. Don't miss it. God help me, I'm not going to miss it. I'm going out clinging to him. If God takes me, I want him to take me in Nairobi. I'd like to be in the middle of that place. Because you see, once God presents something to you, you're responsible. Now you hear what God's doing through Brother Clendenin and Pastor Carter. All these great things that God's doing, but God wants you and needs you Father, I don't know what else to say. I've said everything that I know that you've laid on my heart. Lord, I have not, a, I've not arrived. 
I'm still one of your weakest vessels. But oh God, I know you told me that this anointing is available to any man, any woman who set their heart. It's not some emotional shaking thing. It's letting the Holy Spirit now open your heart and say, God, once again, use me. God, you're calling so many. I can feel it so strong. You're calling them. You're wooing them saying, now, in these meetings, here, not another time. You've made me promises before, but now, tonight, let it, something in my heart respond now.